uh, let's jump into today's lecture topic. We're going to be talking about the grid um, and specifically how we move by and balance electricity on the grid, how we keep the lights on. All right. So um, we've got this complex system of our electricity grid. Um, let's talk about how it works. Historically, we've had large centralized power plants that typically are powered by fossil fuels um, that send electricity over long distances to the end consumer. Um, but our power system has been changing significantly over the past decade, and really two decades, as we'll talk about today. Um, another big trend that I'll talk about today is actually deregulation in um, wholesale electricity markets and increasing competition into electricity markets. Um, so one of the things that often we don't really think about is how our uh, um, electric electricity industry is regulated. Um, and uh, uh, so we'll we'll dive into that today. Anyway, another big thing that I'll talk about is uh, extreme weather and climate change because extreme weather is a huge disruptor of of our grid. Um, it's one of the reasons why um, the Inflation Reduction Act and the IIJA the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act included significant funds for shoring up and hardening our electricity grid against extreme weather, um, as we talked about earlier with um, the extreme weather event in Florida affecting their grid. All right. And as I mentioned earlier, energy storage certainly is a huge um, revolutionary, revolutionary technology from a grid standpoint. Um, historically, the grid has had a limited ability to store electricity. Um, because, uh, which is, you know, a challenge because the grid needs to meet supply and demand in real time. And so with innovation and cost declines in battery energy storage in particular, this has created a new and exciting uh, electricity asset um, that can help improve reliability and integrate more and more renewables into the grid. All right. So, We've seen you know, lots of changes happening on the grid, really exciting um, uh, uh, time and opportunity, but also lots of challenges. You know, I mentioned uh, climate-related power outages that are caused by extreme weather um, are what trigger the majority of blackouts on our grid, um, such as hurricanes and wildfires. Um, so as our climate has changed, we've seen a significant increase in those power outages that are caused by those weather events, um, and which is why we see a lot of utilities increasing investments in hardening the grid, um, uh, supported by federal funds, as I mentioned, like foliage management, you know, making sure that trees are, um, there's enough distance between trees and transmission lines and distribution lines, as well as undergrounding transmission lines. Um, so the electricity grid, you know, it's it's important in our lives. It's maybe not something we think about all that much, um, but it's you know an essential service that uh, can often go underappreciated. Um, but at the same time, you know, when when the grid goes down, uh, we can't carry out a lot of important functions like pumping water or refrigerating medicine or powering hospitals. Um, and one of several examples of uh, you know major power outage in the last few years was in the end of 2017, when Hurricane Maria wiped out about 80% of Puerto Rico's grid, um, 675,000 people were without power um, in what was one of the longest blackouts in history. Um, it took nine months for the grid operator to fully restore power. One of the reasons why we see a lot of efforts uh, since then in Puerto Rico to, to increase the resiliency of the grid, including bringing solar and energy storage um, uh, and driving, driving adoption of that. In, in Puerto Rico. Um, more recently and, and, and ongoing, we've seen an increase in power outages related to wildfire risk in California and the broader Western US um, because wildfires by and large, uh, the, the major cause of these wildfires has been um, coming into contact with power lines as a result of increased instances of um, weather that's conducive to um, you know, dry, uh, windy weather that that uh, is conducive to, to the power lines coming into contact with with nearby trees. Um, so as a result, it's actually become common for utilities in California and throughout the West to pro pre pre proactively turn off power supply in areas of high wildfire risk during um, climate conditions that are conducive to wildfires. 
Uh, again, more recently in 2021, in February of 2021, uh, really unprecedented and icy storm um, hit Texas, which led to uh, forced power outages over the course of multiple days for four and a half million customers in, in Texas. Um, you know, there were over 80 deaths with this event, with this event um, lack of access to food and, and safe drinking water and heating for many during this icy storm, uh, extensive build, building damage. You know, in terms of if, if folks read the recommended reading, uh, what, what was the cause of this power outage? A lot of the natural gas and coal plants were not winterized, so they couldn't handle the cold weather. They didn't have the correct infrastructure to handle extreme low temperatures. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, about half of ERCOT, uh, the Texas grid operator's uh, nameplate capacity, or half of the nameplate capacity in ERCOT, I should say, we'll talk about that distinction in a little bit, was unavailable due to that lack of winterization. Um, and by and large, it was, you know, natural gas power plants um, and natural gas pipelines that, uh, uh, where, that had that issue. Um, you know, I think when, when this happened, uh, a lot of conservative media wanted to put blame on renewable energy resources because Texas is pretty progressive and, and, and a leader in terms of deployment of renewable energy on the grid. Um, but by and large, it was that lack of winterization of the natural gas power plants that caused those outages. Uh, don't mess with Texas. Texas has its own power grid um, and doesn't like a lot of uh, inter, interstate flow. Um, doesn't enable a lot of interstate flow of, of electricity from its neighbors. Um, uh, and this is a huge uh, factor that we're going to talk about today, you know, the importance of having bigger, more diverse and integrated grids um, and enabling uh, uh, more reliability. On the flip side of that, they have a competitive grid which allows people to choose their electricity source and helps with the proliferation of renewables because they are cheaper. So there's a way to choose from both sides. Yeah, so we so Texas has retail deregulation, another concept that we'll talk about today, where uh, customers can choose who their electricity provider is. Um, actually, you know, one of the challenges is retail deregulation is that electricity providers don't necessarily have an incentive to avoid blackouts. In fact, they like seeing um, conditions that lead to high uh, that, that that lead to high prices, um, including. Um, uh, lack lack of supply resources that, that could lead to those um, high price events. So the criticisms of uh, Texas and, and the ERCOT power market when this happened was that that retail deregulation doesn't um, uh, uh, doesn't really help to avoid these blackout situations. One one big thing that I'll mention is that you know um, that unusual ice storm uh, precipitated by climate change really caused an unprecedented uh, level of demand and um, what would have been record-breaking demand if the forced power outages hadn't happened. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about supply side dynamics, um, but you also have to think about the demand side and the fact that Texas doesn't have a lot of demand side programs um, to help uh, manage demand in, in, a, in an event like this. Um, and more recently, uh, you know, I think in response to, to this event, Texas, uh, I think just authorized um, a couple big fossil fuel powered power plants to help uh, shore up against these types of events. Um, but in my opinion, didn't necessarily actually, that it, decision wasn't really informed by the actual factors that caused this unprecedented power outage. All right. And then even more recently, uh, earlier this year, um, we've seen significant power outages both in Nevada and California caused by you know, the recurring atmospheric rivers, storms that are caused by uh, uh, and supercharged by the atmospheric rivers that are happening here in the West. Um, in Nevada on New Year's Eve, um, Northern Nevada in particular, we saw uh, wet and heavy snow because of this atmospheric river that caused tree branches across Northern Nevada to um, fall onto dis distribution lines. Um, and there were, because of this, you know, it wasn't a centralized power outage. There were over 1,000 um, uh, locations on the grid uh, that were sources of failure. And it took NV Energy um, over a week to fully restore power because, because it was so, it was such a distributed power outage um, in, in kind of an unprecedented way. 
And then in California, um, you know, we saw recurring atmospheric river charged storms um, causing widespread flooding and mudslides and also power, power outages, both in January, but a really big one as well in March. So the electricity grid is really important. We want to keep the lights on. Um, and there are a lot of factors that you have to think about um, demand, supply, and also, you know, weather in order to do it. So in addition to weather, weather related power outages, um, we've also another major factor affecting the grid is a rapid increase in wind and solar on uh, in, in our electricity mix around the world and in the US, um, which has been paired with an acceleration of retirements of coal and nuclear power plants, which are kind of the traditional um, uh, electricity resources that grid operators are used to dealing with. Um, this chart it shows the global electricity mix both historically and then also a forecast. Uh, I'd say um, this is the kind of uh, more moderate scenario from, from Bloomberg New Energy Finance for a forecast of, uh, of where our electricity mix is growing, going around the world. All right, so in California, the challenges of uh, integrating solar generation and renewable generation onto the grid, but solar in particular, is depicted by the so-called duck curve uh, that you learned about in your readings and, and videos. And to recap, uh, the duck curve refers to the shape of the net demand. Um, demand is also known as load, so this is also called the net load curve, um, which is total electricity demand, total system electricity system demand minus the renewable energy supply. And the reason why you subtract out the renewable energy supply is because renewables are dispatched first on the grid because they have zero marginal costs. They have no fuel costs. Um, so, uh, so whenever the wind and, and is blowing and, and the sun is shining, those resources, they get dispatched on the grid. So the net load curve captures the ramping requirements of the non-renewable energy generation resource base on the grid whenever solar and, and wind aren't, aren't available. And this ramping need, it's particularly high uh, in the evening. Um, in the early evening, when the sun sets uh, about simultaneous to when demand peaks, um, people come home, they turn on their lights, they turn on their air conditioning, um, they're increasingly plugging in their electric vehicles. Um, so peak demand um, on the California grid uh, generally happens between 7 and 9 p.m., at the same time that the sun's setting, and you've got uh, uh, 16 gigawatts of ramping need for non-renewable generation resources um, over the course of three hours. And to give you a sense of scale, you know, total electricity demand, uh, this is an example of, of the California um, uh, grid, uh, total power demand at the top and the net load curve at the bottom. Um, total power demand uh, at any given day is, is almost 25 gigawatts. So, so huge ramping need uh, when you're talking about 16 gigawatt, gigawatts, and it's not easily accomplished um, when you think about the fact that coal and nuclear power plants don't ramp up and down that easily. All right. Um, so growing renewable energy on the grid increases those ramping needs. Um, and uh, another challenge that comes up in this that curve that we're talking about here is that renewable supply could actually outstrip and, and has outstripped demand um, in the middle of the day. Uh, you can see it with the net load curve, the green curve getting almost to zero um, on this spring day in, on the California grid um, at the, in, in the belly of the duck. Um, and that means that there's a need to do something with that excess generation. Um, you could curtail it. You could turn off wind and solar, not ideal. Um, you could store it. Um, you could also incent uh, demand side resources to shift electricity demand from other parts of the net, uh, other times of the day, um, like between the seven to nine period to the, um, to the middle of the day to capture some of that excess generation. Um, but we'll talk more about the, the grid tools, um, the, the tools that grid operators have to, to manage that. So that's the duck curve, in case you couldn't see you know, the duck in the previous lines. Um, and I just wanna call out, Diana might, might pull it up in the electricity generation lecture, but you can actually go onto the California ISO website and see the ISO duck curve uh, kind of live. You can see these lines happening and where generation is coming from. Um, I also wanna make the point, you know, the duck curve really captures the challenges of integrating solar into the grid. 
Um, but wind energy, you know, it's you don't really necessarily have that deck curve per se, but you have much shorter and more fre frequent ramping needs as the wind resource um, varies throughout the day. All right, and as, as we talked about earlier, um, you know, another big dynamic affecting the grid are, uh, you know, it, it's not just about changes in supply, um, it's also about changes on the demand side. Um, you know, air conditioners are a big source of demand. Um, usage of air conditioning is often coincident with peak demand on the grid and really a driver of peak demand of when, when that peak demand occur occurs. 30% um, of US peak load is attributable to air conditioning. Um, and 87% uh, of households have, have air conditioning. Um, and of course, you might imagine that as uh, temperatures continue to rise um, and as you know, uh, air pollution increases in the Western region because of uh, wildfires, uh, that air conditioning demand is gonna increase. Um, air conditioning adoption isn't as high in many, many other countries. Um, so other uh, developing countries in particular, as they develop and um, adopt more, adopt <laughs> and becomes more prevalent, they're gonna um, have uh, face these challenges as well. Um, this is one of the reasons why pushing for more efficient air conditioning um, uh, and things like heat pumps is, is so important. All right, and there's a similar story with electrification of buildings and transportation, uh, both of which have the potential to significantly increase <laughs> demand on the grid and exacerbate those ramping requirements. To give you a sense of scale, the, the um, typical US residential home has a maximum demand of about eight kilowatts and the typical EV2 charger and the home draws about seven kilowatts. So EV charging has the potential to double the peak demand of a residential home. But there's also a huge opportunity in this electrification trend where uh, you know, if you can control, if grid operators and utilities can control when EV charging happens and when uh, buildings use their electric appliances, then um, you can uh, almost use those, those assets as a form of energy storage um, because you're you know, shifting demand to the middle of the day. Um, NV Energy recently changed their, uh, when, uh, when uh, their electricity rate structure to incentivize EV chargers to charge during the middle of the day when solar generation is at its highest, to give an example. These evolving grid dynamics hopefully give you a sense that the grid is providing, uh, the value that the grid is providing as an electricity consumer is more than just the electricity generated. It's also the reliable delivery of power um, uh, of that electricity through the transmission and distribution system. Um, you can see here that uh, for the typical PG&E Pacific Gas and Electric customer, um, uh, residential customer, generation makes up only 40% of the cost of electricity. Um, distribution and transmission make up over, over half. Um, so the cost per megawatt hour to generate electricity is just one component of how we should think about the economics of, of electricity. I want to uh, make a quick note on uh, terminology here, the difference between retail and wholesale. Um, so if we talk about wholesale generation and electricity, we're talking about the 40% the um, piece of the pie, the generation. Um, but if we're talking about retail, uh, it includes the whole pie and, and what customers are actually paying in terms of dollar per megawatt hour for electricity on their residential bill. All right. So today we're going to talk about what is electricity, how we transmit electricity, uh, how the electricity industry is structured, um, how reliability is ma maintained on the grid, and how we buy and sell electricity in markets. Lots to cover, um, so bear with me. Okay, so electricity is an energy currency. It's not a primary energy resource because it doesn't occur naturally in our environment in any useful form. Um, so it's an energy currency. And uh, there are a few different ways that we can uh, uh, generate electricity. First is from a heat engine by using energy resources to boil water. Typically, this has been fossil fuels or nuclear. Um, but there are also some renewable energy resources like geothermal and solar thermal and ocean thermal. Um, another way is by harnessing the kinetic energy from certain energy resources directly, uh, as is the case with wind and hydro, uh, tides, waves, flywheels, and uh, the salinity gradient of the ocean. Um, 
or uh, through electrochemical processes, as is the case with solar photovoltaics and batteries and fuel cells. Um, so the primary way that we've generated that we generate electricity today and that we have for the last century is using the top line process, uh, that heat engine for thermal electricity generation. Um, and that thermoelectric generation has primarily been dominated by fossil fuels, coal and natural gas, and to a lesser extent, nuclear. But that's really, as we've talked about, rapidly changing with the growth of wind and solar on the grid. All right, so uh, busy slide. These are some of the key terms, though, that we use to describe electricity. Uh, I think Diana talked about these a little bit in the Energy Basics video in the first week of class. And you've also got, uh, I think, two different math review sheets that go into more detail. But to recap uh, about the difference between power and energy, um, we like to use the analogy of water flowing through a pipe, um, where energy, which is measured in watt hours or kilowatt hours, is analogous to the amount of water flowing through the pipe. And power that's measured in watts or kilowatts is analogous to the flow rate. So to give a concrete example, um, a microwave draws about a kilowatt of power when it's turned on. Um, if we turn on our microwave and you know, pop some popcorn or whatever for an hour, well, you probably have some pretty burnt popcorn, but uh, that would mean that uh, you'd consume a kilowatt hour of electricity. And just to give you a sense of cost, uh, that would cost us using average electricity prices across the US about 15 cents, which is actually pretty cheap. Okay, um, and there are three important properties of power. You've got current, voltage, and resistance. Uh, current is measured in amps, and it refers to uh, the rate at which electrons, also known as charge, uh, flow through a given point or area. Um, in order to get uh, current to flow through a conductor like a wire, um, you apply voltage to it. So voltage, uh, which is measured in volts, is the push of electricity. And it's analogous to a pressure, the pressure difference in your water pipe. Uh, resistance, using the water analogy again, is the friction in your pipe. Um, so it's measured in ohms. All right, so uh, this chart, it gives you a sense of the scale of consumption in terms of power. Um, you know, we talked about how a microwave draws about a kilowatt of power at any given time when it's turned on. Uh, charging your cell phone is probably about a watt. Um, the average home power demand, I talked about peak, but the average home power demand at, at uh, any given time, uh, average, excuse me, is between one and one and a half kilowatts. Um, but obviously sometimes it can be a lot higher than that or significantly lower if you're not, depending on what electrical appliances you're using and whether or not you, you've got an EV charger that you've got plugged in. All right, and in terms of supply resources, uh, power plants can range quite a, quite a lot in size. Uh, you know, for a residential solar project, it could be five to seven kilowatts. But on the high end of the scale, you know, you've got a typical nuclear power plant that could be a gigawatt. All right, so we talk a lot about supply, but our ultimate end goal is to ensure that there's enough electricity to meet demand. Uh, so demand is really what we're solving for and what we care about. You know, we want uh, to deliver those energy services, keep the lights on, um, our showers hot, our, beer, our beers cold, right? Um, so electricity demand uh, also, uh, again, referred to as load. Um, it varies over, over time, and it also varies across geographies um, at the national, international, and uh, regional and local levels. Um, for example, you can see in these charts what the load curve looks like over the course of a year across different countries. And you can see that um, France's electricity demand peaks in the winter because they have high electric heating needs in the, in the winter, while U.S. electricity demand peaks in the summer when air conditioning demand um, is, is at its highest. And, you know, these charts, they show electricity demand averaged by month, um, but grid operators have to have, also have to think about you know, meeting supply and demand um, and instantaneous peak demand throughout the day to ensure that the lights stay on. So in instances where, you know, you see this big difference between peak demand um, and the lowest demand, like, like in the US, uh, um, that, that means that there's gonna be a lot of electricity generation resources and electricity generation capacity on that grid that doesn't get used a lot of the time because you need enough capacity to, to be able to meet even the highest times of peak demand, even if those high peak demand periods only last for 5% you know, of the year. Um, so that's gonna mean that you have a lot of power plants with really low rates of utilization 
um, that are those peaker power plants um, that are measured by a metric. Uh, utilization is measured by a metric called capacity factor that Diana is going to um, help you to calculate uh, next week. All right. So a few more key terms um, about electricity. Um, on the supply side. So some supply resources are what we, we call base load generation that can have a constant power output over time um, in order to meet that minimum level of demand, the base, the base load um, that's always present throughout the course of the day. So the base load is the minimum level of demand over 24 hours and base load generation are power plants that have that constant output that can meet that base load. Um, however, those baseload resources, as we talked about, they're, they're not very dispatchable, like coal and nuclear. Um, they're not very flexible because it takes a long time for them to ramp up and down. Um, so uh, that creates challenges um, as we integrate more and more renewable energy resources on the grid. And you get that belly of the debt curve um, uh, causing baseload generation to have to power down um, where historically they've kind of been, been always on. Um, so in that context, baseload generation is actually becoming a little bit of a liability um, uh, uh, to the grid, something that we'll talk about more. Um, so hopefully this gives you a sense that certain supply-side resources have different values to the grid depending on how flexible they are, how easily they can ramp up and down, in addition to how much they cost. Okay, so let's talk about how electricity is, is transmitted. Um, and I want to make the point today's lecture is really focused on uh, the U.S. Uh, electricity grid and and uh, and structure, um, which you know there are a lot of similarities in how the electricity industry and grid is structured in the developed world, other developed countries like the EU and um, and and even developing countries like China. Um, but uh, obviously, there's a significant portion of the developing world that has uh, electricity access issues still, where um, grid dynamics are and priorities are a lot different. And that's something that's gonna be covered in the developing world lecture. All right, so fundamental to understanding how we transmit electricity is the difference between uh, the two types of electricity. You've got alternating current or AC and direct current or DC. AC has oscillating current and voltage and DC has constant current and voltage as the name implies. So generators, by default, they produce uh, AC because when you have a coil rotating within a magnetic field with every 180 degree rotation of that uh, coil, you've got a change in current and voltage. But the direct current, by contrast, um, is produced by sources like batteries and solar PV panels that have fixed positive and negative terminals. So current is always flowing through the battery in the same direction. Okay, so the US grid predominantly runs on AC, um, and the speed with which the current alternates on the grid is called frequency, it's measured in hertz, and the frequency of the US grid is 60 hertz, or 60 cycles per second. So every generator on the grid needs to operate at, uh, at that frequency, more or less. All right, so our grid is dominated by AC power, uh, but that wasn't always a given. I wanna talk about the war of the currents um, in the late 19th century. Uh, Thomas Edison, um, I think we all know his name, his vision for the electricity grid was one of DC. He imagined that the grid would be made up of small scale distributed power plant plants that serve local customers with DC power within a limited region. And this contrasted with George Westinghouse and Nikola Tesla. Um, Tesla, like Edison, was an inventor. Uh, Tesla invented the AC motor and the transformer. And unlike Edison, Tesla and Westinghouse believed in uh, believe that the grid should operate on AC um, and should be made up of large scale power plants that transmit electricity over long distances within uh, across multiple regions. And the reason why Edison wanted these you know smaller scale power plants is because you couldn't efficiently transmit DC over uh, over long distances. Um, and, but because of the transformer that Nikola Tesla had, had invented, um, you could do that with, with AC. You could increase the voltage and decrease the line losses. Um, and an interesting dynamic to think about, of, you know, as distributed energy resources um, increase, how do we make sure we do that resilient, resiliently and we take advantage of the resiliency aspects that could come with those distributed energy resources while also taking advantage of uh, the resiliency aspects that come with a bigger, more regional grid. Okay, 
So ultimately AC1, as we talked about, because of the um, ability to transmit electricity over long distances with lower line losses, um, as you hopefully all read about in the math review sheet number five. Okay, so our transmission distribution system was designed for AC power. Um, and typically you've got your centralized power plant gener that generates AC power at three to 30 kilovolts. Kilo is a thousand, so kilovolts is a thousand volts. Um, before it goes onto the transmission lines, a transmission substation uses a step-up transformer to increase the voltage uh, to at least 138 kilovolts um, and sometimes as high as a thousand kilovolts, although that's a little more rare. Um, and before it reaches your local grid, the voltage is stepped down between uh, 120 and 240 kilovolts. Um, and a customer's uh, electricity consumption is measured through what's called a meter. So hence the term behind the meter to refer to uh, everything on the customer side of the meter and the term in front, of, uh, in front of the meter to refer to everything on the utility side of the meter. So your house that runs on AC, um, so it comes out of the plug as AC, um, but not all of your appliances run on AC, right? Some of your big, bigger appliances like motors um, that, that have motors like refrigerators and washing machines typically run on AC, but some of the smaller lower power appliances like your laptops and your cell phones run on DC. Um, so uh, what you often have with um, DC appliances, um, you need a rectifier in your, say in your um, laptop chargers that converts AC to DC and then a transformer to get it to the right uh, voltage um, from the building's 120 volt socket. Uh, sidebar, if you want to convert um, DC to AC, um, like you might need to do with a solar PV panel that generates DC power um, in order to feed it into the electricity grid, you need an inverter. All right, so about 12% of all US power lines are transmission lines, and the remainder are uh, dedicated to distribution. All right, so efficiency losses in the US transmission and distribution system are about 6%, and 2% are due to line losses. Um, in the transmission system, and 4% is, is distribution. Um, so the losses largely come from, as we talked about earlier, the transformers. Um, this map uh, gives you a sense of uh, transmission distribution, the T&D losses by country. And you can see that losses in several other countries are significantly higher than that in the US, um, not just because of outdated grid, grid systems, but also from theft, um, people illegally tapping into the grid and uh, um, to, steal, to steal power. Okay, so back to the US. The US is actually made up of three main grids. You've got the Western interconnection, interconnection and the Eastern inter interconnection, uh, both of which share uh, portions of Canada's grid. <laughs> and as we've talked about, you've got Texas, uh, the ERCOT interconnection. ERCOT stands for Electric Reliability Council of Texas, but everyone just calls it ERCOT. Um, so Texas has its own electricity grid, um, limiting interstate pay transfers uh, really allows Texas to avoid um, certain federal jurisdiction over its grid, um, which is one of the reasons why Texas couldn't import electricity during that big uh, icy storm and power outage that happened in February of 2021. So the flow of electricity is restricted between each of these grids. Um, uh, Although you know all of the North American power uh, power grids um, operate at the same frequency, they're not in sync with each other. So in order to um, uh, allow electricity to flow between the grids, um, you need uh, high voltage direct current transmission lines to connect to the various grids, where uh, the systems um, use a rectifier to convert one region's AC into DC, and then the HVDC line transmits to the next region where an inverter uh, converts it back um, into AC for the new region and to the right and, and, and with the, in the right phase. So within each of these grids, electricity flows, um, uh, travels the path of least resistance. Um, so you can think about each of these kind of uh, almost like a big pool in which the grid operators have limited some, but mostly limited ability to control the flow of electricity. Um, and this is important because it means that there's a difference between the contractual flow of electricity and the physical flow of electricity. Um, so for example, when Stanford says that they have a power purchase agreement, a long-term contract to purchase electricity from solar 
PV plants in Central and Southern California, where some of our uh, colleagues are visiting today. Um, uh, Stan physically, Stanford is not probably not taking delivery of, uh, of that electricity, but contractually, Stanford can claim um, uh, uh, claim responsibility for that electricity uh, because that so those solar PV projects wouldn't have been built without that contract. So legally, um, contractual agreements around these electricity are recognized as um, uh, uh, as as you know actual delivery, even if physical delivery isn't happening. So as we talked about earlier, even though AC went out in the War of the Currents um, in the late 19th century, uh, DC is still fairly prominent in our electricity systems, both in terms of our end uses like data centers and um, uh, uh, well, uh, and, and batteries and um, electric appliances like um, consumer electronics. Um, and, uh, and because we've had innovations in solid state inverters and voltage source converters that make uh, increasing and decreasing voltage of DC power uh, more efficient and easier. Um, uh, we've, we've also seen, um, as, as we talked about earlier, uh, an increase in the use of HVDC transmission lines, high voltage direct current transmission lines. <laughs> um, so these HVDC lines have greater uh, um, uh, efficiency in terms of uh, lower line losses. Uh, but one of the challenges that, is that you have to convert the AC to DC in order to um, use those HVDC lines and then back to, to AC again, which creates losses as well. So it's really an optimization equation where um, you, know, you have to make sure that your HVDC line is long enough um, so that the uh, efficiency gains of transmitting over, over, uh, over DC um, justify the efficiency losses of converting the AC to DC and then back again. Um, so there are lots of HVDC lines under development that shows a map of, of, of some of them, um, many of which are being used to transmit uh, power from uh, you know, the windiest areas of the US uh, to, to high demand areas, because oftentimes um, those windy areas are, are not where the areas of demand are. Okay. Let's talk about how the electricity industry is structured and regulated. Okay, so a utility is an entity that maintains infrastructure that provides an essential good to the public. Essential goods could be electricity, natural gas, water, phone service, or even the internet. Um, this map, it shows the uh, electric utilities um, that are present in California. There are, I think, over 50 of them. Um, a lot of people, you know, in general, don't think a lot about who their utility is or where they're getting their power. Um, and uh, it's not just that, uh, you know, what we care about is not necessarily where our electricity come from, comes from, but just that our lights stay on, you know, our, we, we continue to have hot showers and cold beers, right? Um, but part of the reason why we also, uh, the general public doesn't, doesn't think a lot about their utility is their ut utilities have historically been uh, very bad at, customer engagement, because oftentimes they don't have to be. Um, and part of the reason for that is that historically, electric utilities have been regulated as what's called uh, natural monopolies. Um, a, na a natural monopoly exists in a region if, uh, um, or, or in a market, if a single firm can um, operate and serve that market at a lower cost than multiple firms operating in that market. Um, often natural monopolies have high fixed costs and experience economies of scale. So this, this uh, photo demonstrates the point uh, of, of a natural monopoly. It shows New York City in 1888 uh, with a bunch of telegraph and power lines. Um, so you know it's definitely more costly and inefficient uh, to have multiple utilities operating multiple power lines when really... Um, if you just had one, one power line in a neighborhood, it could serve all of those customers um, equally well and at a lower cost. So because of this, uh, typically governments regulate uh, and, and designate a single utility as a regulated monopoly to own and operate transmission and deliver electricity in a particular market. Um, but the challenge with regulated monopolies is that there's no market competition. 
Um, so customers can't choose between different utilities to buy electricity. Um, so the utility can charge whatever price they want. So in exchange for granting that uh, monopoly status, governments regulate the price of electricity um, so that utilities uh, can't charge uh, too high for that essential good. So regulating rates is one of the reasons why we regulate the electricity industry. Um, there are a few other reasons why we regulate the, like, the industry, like safety, reliability, and environmental impacts. Um, but I'm gonna talk a lot today about price regulation. And there are two main uh, types of entities that regulate electricity prices. Um, first, at the federal level, you've got the Federal Energy Regula Regulatory Commission in the US, FERC, um, that regulates wholesale interstate electricity flows. And then at the state level, typically you've got the Public Utilities Commission or the PUC that regulates the retail rate of electricity for uh, private utilities like PG&E. Um, but if you have public utilities um, like uh, you know, City of Palo Alto Utilities, um, then it's the city that regulates uh, the utility prices. All right, so historically, the utility landscape in the US looked a bit like this map. Um, we had vertically integrated monopolistic utilities owning and operating the power plants and the transmission distribution system all on their own within their uh, own service territories. And there was limited competition or sharing of resource, resources between the utility service territories. Um, so there are you know, thousands of utilities in the US, um, including the ones that you see on this map um, that historically operated as a monopoly within their own kind of provincial regions. This diagram, uh, it shows the different assets that an electric utility typically or historically has owned and operated. Um, you've got wholesale generation at the top, you've got the transmission system, and then you've got the distribution system. So the wholesale side is of, of the utility is not necessarily considered a natural monopoly. And because of this, we've, we've actually seen deregulation of the wholesale side of electricity generation over time um, in the US and in other countries. Uh, and this has been, uh, so th this process is known as wholesale deregulation. I'll talk about retail deregulation, which is a little different. Um, so uh, deregulation of the electric utility industry refers to the shift from that vertically integrated monopoly that owns generation transmission and distribution to multiple companies um, like independent, uh, also known as independent power producers or kind of non-utility electricity generators. Um, that uh, can feed power into the utility-owned transmission and distribution system. <clears throat> All right. So the first step in the US towards uh, this wholesale deregulation uh, was during the OPEC oil embargo of the 1970s. I mentioned it in the history of fossil fuel lecture, uh, or video, excuse me, um, where in order to help diversify the uh, electricity mix in the US, the uh, the government, the federal government passed the Public Utilities Regulatory Policies Act, or PERPA, um, which required electric utilities to purchase electricity from those third power party independent power producers, or IPPs. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, prior to PERPA, if you were a utility, you know, you'd want to continue operating your coal and, uh, in some instances, oil-fired power plants, although oil is no longer a major uh, part of our electricity mix in the U.S., um, but at the time it was. So uh, PERPA really played a big role in forcing utilities to um, uh, go beyond just protecting their existing generation assets like coal and oil to uh, buying, at least at the time, uh, more electricity from natural gas generation from independent power producers. Um, but you know, today PERPA has, um, since then PERPA has played a really big role in pushing uh, more renewable energy onto the grid as well. All right. so. Um, transmission and distribution are still largely regulated as a natural monopoly, but generation and wholesale power prices um, have become deregulated and so, uh, set within a competitive market. Um, so in addition to PERPA, you've got FERC Orders 888 and 889 that established uh, in the late 1990s nonprofit companies to operate the grid and ensure access to the transmission system. These nonprofits that are called independent system operators and regional transmission organizations, ISOs and RTOs are pretty much the same thing. 
Um, they operate open competitive processes for power producers to sell into competitive wholesale electricity markets. Um, so the transmission and distribution system is still owned by the utility and it's owned and operated by the utility. Um, but the ISOs and RTOs um, really just make sure that uh, um, that uh, other um, generators have access and, and can route power through that system. Today, we have seven RTOs and ISOs um, shown on this map on the right here uh, that manage competition in US transmission systems, serving about two thirds of load in the US. Outside of that system, it's all just managed by a monopolistic utility still, um, like you know, NV Energy in, in Nevada. Um, but this means that in the RTO and ISO regions, you've got you know markets that uh, that that are setting the price for for wholesale for the wholesale side of electricity. All right, um, and and any generator can bid into the market to deliver electricity to, to customers. This really has um, two benefits for the grid. First, um, uh, the expansion of RTOs and ISOs has really been a big driver of renewable energy onto the grid because. You know, uh, utilities um, who, you know, as a monopoly, uh, would would otherwise protect their existing generation resources like coal, um, nuclear, and natural gas. Uh, they're forced to compete with low cost wind and solar. Um, so, in many of these regions, these open markets have really been a major driver of retirements of um, no longer economic coal and nuclear power plants. Um, the other big uh, Result and benefit of these regional electricity markets um, uh, is um, that they facilitate more sharing of electricity um, resources and a more diverse uh, uh, load profile within these regions, um, facilitating resiliency, um, which uh, in turn helps um, uh, support more and more renewable energy integration. Um, it's one of the reasons why you hear a uh, discussion about, you know, building out transmission, more transmission to connect grids um, as a major factor in supporting renewable energy integration. Um, all right, so these acronyms ISOs and RTOs aren't something that you necessarily hear about every day, but they played a big role in renewable energy growth um, and, and in our electricity system overall. Okay, so we talked about wholesale competition. Um, let's talk about retail competition. Um, so in, in wholesale competition, uh, like you see here, um, the utility is the only entity that has the relationship with the customer and can sell electricity to the customer. But some states have also pushed for retail competition uh, where um, uh, any entity can come into the market and sell electricity directly to the customer, um, like you see in the diagram here. Um, so retail deregulation means that customers lose who they purchase their electricity from, much like they do with their phone or internet service. Um, so if anyone here is from Texas or Australia, um, you likely have uh, a choice of who you can buy your electricity from. Uh, all right, and this map shows um, the states where, uh, you know, orange states have full retail choice. Um, there are a lot of, there are a few other states that have partial retail choice. Um, uh, 13 states in Washington, DC have full retail deregulation. Um, so this open competition means that uh, the retail price of electricity is no longer regulated by the government, which can, uh, as we talked about in the Texas example, it can actually introduce a lot of challenges and expose the consumer to the high price risk. Um, a key example of this, in addition to the Texas example, was um, in California uh, in the early 2000s, California began the process of retail deregulation, um, uh, um, but uh, when that process was happening, several companies, including Enron, um, uh, and in particular Enron, attempted to manipulate retail electricity prices, um, causing prices to skyrocket and leading to rolling brownouts and blackouts. I mean, ultimately the first bankruptcy of PG&E. And that really put a stop to de retail deregulation in California, which is why, why California only has that partial, partial retail, retail choice. Um, and, and it really exposes the challenges with retail deregulation. Many would argue that the additional benefits of enabling customers to have retail choice don't really, um, 
justify the risks involved with deregulation because wholesale generation and wholesale competition uh, really uh, um, has uh, already does a lot to advance more clean and renewable energy and more diverse resources in, in our electricity market. But even though retail deregulation has not is not really moving forward in states in the US anymore, we still see uh, new ways of retail choice um, uh, uh, being introduced. Um, you know, for example, we see commercial customers increasingly uh, procuring electricity directly, um, which is what this chart shows you on the right with, you know, Amazon, Google, uh, Stanford, um, entering into long-term contracts with renewable energy projects directly. Um, and, you know, you've got uh, distributed energy resources with rooftop solar, enabling uh, folks to choose uh, whether or not they've got, uh, they can put solar on their roofs. Um, and then the advent also of community choice aggregators. Um, as I talked about, uh, Stanford has contracts with two utility scale solar projects um, in uh, Central uh, and Southern California to serve um, the bulk of its electricity load. Um, there's certainly though uh, the challenge and the question of uh, the fact that the solar generation profile of those projects don't necessarily match uh, the demand profile of, um, of Stanford. All right, in terms of who the players are on the retail side, you've got investor-owned utilities uh, that are private like PG&E. Um, you've got publicly owned utilities like the City of Palo Alto Utilities and Sacramento Municipal Utilities District that are both owned and managed by the respective governments, local governments. You've also got federally owned utilities like Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, TBA is the only federally owned utility that has retail customers. Um, there are four federally owned utilities though, including uh, Bonneville Authority, uh, many of which uh, were established by the federal government either to promote other, for other reasons in electricity, like economic development in the Tennessee Valley or um, you know, managing all the federal hydro plants that were developed during uh, the world wars um, in the Pacific Northwest. And then finally, you've got power marketers. Enron was a power marketer. They don't, typically don't own generation. They just buy and sell power on the market and take advantage of price arbitrage opportunities. All right, so this pie chart shows you the mix of these players on the retail side. Um, investor and utilities dominate. Um, and this shows you uh, the mix of players on the wholesale side. Um, because of PERPA and deregulation, we've seen a huge growth in independent power producers, PPs. All right, so I wanna end um, today's lecture by looking at a uh, clip that I think helps bring to life the, um, how the dynamics of the electricity grid and how we manage the electricity. that the thing works at all. It's 7 p.m. and in homes up and down the country, cookers, heaters, television sets are being switched on. At the National Grid Control Centre, National Balancing Engineer Simon Jeffcoat's on duty. Arrayed on the wall in front of him is his view of Britain from above. The country's been tipped on its side and every high-power electricity connection from the far north of Scotland to Cornwall has been mapped out in loving detail. But Simon is bracing himself for the most difficult moment of his day by watching EastEnders. When the credits start to roll, he's going to have to deal with a massive surge in electrical demand what's known as a TV pickup. We're expecting uh, a pickup of around about uh, three gigawatts, which is 3,000 million watts, or equivalent to one and a half to one and three quarter million kettles going on. So we expect the demand to pick up over a period of about five minutes. Power surges like this are unique to Britain. No other country in the world switches on so many kettles in so short a time. To cope with the strain, Simon has had to put specialised power stations on standby as far away as Snowdonia and Scotland. <laughs> 
These hydroelectric plants can set thousands of tonnes of water plunging down the hillside at a moment's notice, generating huge bursts of power in a matter of seconds. But Simon is also having to ask our neighbours across the channel for a favour. To assist us with the end of uh, EastEnders, we have uh, the French uh, link picking up, and they are picking up um, 600 megawatts at 100 megawatts a minute. So that's, again, a very rapid response. Simon is slave to this flickering frequency indicator, which he has to keep as close as possible to 50 hertz. If there's not enough power in the national grid, it drops off the scale. Too much, and it shoots off the other side. And he has to judge his timing perfectly, even if the BBC isn't quite working to schedule. We, we've been notified of a time for the end of the programme, and it hasn't actually finished at that time. Which means? It's all yours, mate. Simon fires off instructions from his keyboard. On the other side of the country, vast turbines rumble into life. De Norwick is up to 150. I've just instructed him up to 300 megawatts now. Festiniog is up um, to 90 megawatts. It's full output. French piling in now. Two minutes into the TV pickup, and it looks like there's going to be more than enough power to go round. And then suddenly, there's a problem. What is it? Oh, is it the French link? Yeah. There's a trip on the additional supply from France. The frequency has dropped dramatically. We're going to be fine, I'm sure. Simon has just moments to cover the sudden shortfall. He rapidly sends out instructions to get one more hydroelectric plant online. Then, once more, the supply heads back into the safe zone. Uh, it was immediate decision. The as soon as the frequency uh, dropped through 49.8, I had to react. The delicate balance of our electricity supply has been restored for now. And across the country, a million kettles keep on boiling. Britain's day is drawing to a close. By now, all that can be seen of Britain from above is illuminated by the power that Simon and his colleagues are squirting round the country. Eight million streetlights have flared into life. Office buildings blaze as our information economy trades on through the night. All right. So uh, that video gives you a sense, you know, Simon's a grid operator. It gives you a sense of uh, how uh, he needs to manage supply and demand in real time in order to keep the lights on. Um, and it also shows you the benefit of uh, being able to use generation resources from a variety of different regions, because if one goes down, you can use resource from another another region and you know presumably France isn't watching EastEnders and doesn't have the huge tea kettle issue so it gives you a sense of the value of that diversity of um, demand as well as the diversity of supply and um, maximizing utilization of uh, generation sources. All right let's talk about how we maintain reliability on the grid and keep the lights on. So grid operators they have to strike this delicate balance between Supply, meeting supply and demand uh, in, in real time and maintaining frequency and voltage within a certain range. And when they fail in this endeavor, the, the result is blackout. There are a variety of different factors that cause blackouts, but by and large, severe weather dominates the causes. Other factors could include tree branches coming in contact with transmission lines, as we've talked about uh, you know, in the Northeastern blackout in 2003 as well as the increasing uh, wildfires that have happened in, in California and the Western US. Um, sabotage, uh, both physical and cyber, uh, are, are, are also a risk. Um, 
and one that has uh, garnered increasing attention in recent years. Um, but even, you know, everything from equipment failure to mylar balloons, apparently Valentine's Day is a terrible day for, for the grid, um, to squirrels and other animals, uh, like in this picture from Seattle where a raccoon got into a substation. Um, so a variety of different factors that grid operators have to think about in terms of keeping the lights on. So there's a US-wide entity uh, set up by the federal government and managed by FERC. It's a um, uh, nonprofit uh, entity called the North American Electric Reliability Corporation or NERC. And NERC sets mandatory reliability standards and designates what are called balancing authorities uh, who are charged with implementing these reliability standards and ensuring that supply and demand is met in real time. These balancing authorities are going to be either the RTO or ISO if one exists in a region, or if not, it'll be the utility. So RTOs and ISOs are not just charged with ensuring open access to the, the, to the transmission system and, and, and operating wholesale competitive wholesale electricity markets. They're also charged with maintaining reliability. I want to talk about smart grid technologies and how they can help in uh, bolstering reliability on the grid. Sometimes people conflate the idea of a smart grid with a more distributed grid with one that has, say, more rooftop solar. Uh, but a more distributed grid is not by default smarter or more, or more reliable. Um, the smart grid instead is really just the application of new digital and computing and software technologies and sensors to the grid uh, to make it more flexible and resilient. A successful example of the smart grid is implementation of smart meters. Um, between about 2005 and 2010, there was a huge rollout of smart, smart meters in the US. Um, homes used to have analog meters um, to measure electricity consumption. So uh, there used to be meter readers, these people that would come out and uh, on behalf of the utility to read your meter once, once a month. And this was the only way that utilities would know what your consumption is. But and, and if there was an outage, uh, the utility wouldn't really know about it until folks started calling in and and the utility would only know where the outage was was from because they would triangulate, they'd be able to triangulate based on where the calls were coming in. But that's no longer the case with smart meters, um, because with these meters, utilities get sub 50 minute data on electricity consumption and they know when and who is experiencing out uh, experiencing an outage. Synchrophasers are another example of a smart grid technology. They're mailbox sized devices that grid operators place throughout the grid to measure uh, voltage and frequency in real time. Um, and, and they allow grid operators to monitor grid health and respond in real time to issues. Another example is the use of software and Wi-Fi to um, remotely control and coordinate across distributed energy resources like battery energy storage and increasingly electric vehicles and EV chargers. All right, last but not least, let's talk about how electricity is bought and sold on um, in the electricity markets. A useful way to think about electricity project costs is a metric called levelized cost of energy or LCOE. LCOE takes the lifetime costs of, a pro of an energy project and divides it by the lifetime production to get a cost per megawatt hour. So it's a metric that depicts the true cost of generating a megawatt hour of electricity. This levelized cost of energy assessment uh, here from the, uh, is from Lazard, uh, which is a large asset management firm that, level, that releases their levelized cost of energy assessment every year. And you can see uh, that different electricity generation resources have a different cost per megawatt hour um, based on this LCOE metric. But LCOE isn't the whole picture. There are other characteristics that differentiate electricity resources and affect how valuable that resource is for the grid. We also care about how quickly those megawatt hours can be generated. In other words, how quickly your power plant can ramp up and down. Uh, similar to how people might pay more for ludicrous mode on a Tesla, uh, a grid operator is gonna pay more for a power plant that can ramp up and down quickly in order to meet demand in real time. We also care about how reliable those megawatt hours are. You know, if a grid operator calls on uh, on on a, a generator, are, are the megawatt megawatt hours actually going to be available? You've also got other factors like fuel price risk, um, predictability, social and environmental costs, um, and certainly the development of carbon markets in certain states and regions have helped to incorporate social costs into the actual price of a resource.
So because the, there are different characteristics um, that can be valued beyond just the cost per megawatt hour of these different resources, similarly, we have markets in the US that value and put a price on these different, char these different characteristics of electricity resources. And there are really three main types of markets in competitive wholesale electricity markets. Uh, w within, um, and, and remember those competitive wholesale electricity markets are present within the seven IS ISOs and RTOs in the US. Um, and the markets, they're really differentiated based on time scales. You've got the ancillary services markets up here on the left um, that compensate generators based on how quickly they can ramp up and down um, and how quickly they can come online. They're really about maintaining reliability in the short term um, and ensuring that frequency and voltage is maintained at the right levels on the grid in the short term. There are multiple different types of ancillary services markets that require generators to ramp up and down and respond in different time frames ranging from milliseconds to 30, 30 minutes. All right, second, you've got your energy markets where generators bid in and prices are set in, set in the day ahead, 15 minute and five minute intervals. And then on the far right, you've got your long-term planning and procurement processes where utilities and other entities enter into long-term contracts with generators to ensure that sufficient supply is available to meet demand over long periods of time, particularly during anticipated periods of peak demand. So I'm gonna talk about each of these three markets in turn, and I'm gonna start with the middle one, the wholesale energy markets, because wholesale energy markets is where the bulk of electricity transactions happen, and it's the biggest determinant of wholesale electricity prices. You've got day ahead and 15 minute markets, and sometimes even five minute markets. The 15 and five minute markets are what are known as real time markets. The more frequent the trading is, uh, the more a grid operator can ensure enough supply resources are available in real time to meet demand. And you can imagine that only generators that have the capability to ramp up and down quickly are able to participate in these real time markets. Um, so supply is differentiated by market. Um, slower, slower ramping generators like the so-called base load generators, coal and nuclear, they can't participate in real time markets because it's uh, difficult for them to, uh, to ramp up and down. So, you know, this is an important concept. You know, it's telling us that base load power, power plants don't necessarily lead to more reliability on the, on the grid because they're, they're inflexible, right? They can't help grid operators meet supply and demand in real time. So how the market works is that each generator submits a bid, uh, typically priced at their marginal cost. Um, and here you can see a graphical, graphical representation of a sample day ahead wholesale energy market uh, with generation on the supply side and uh, prices or generation on the x-axis and prices on the y-axis. Um, each line represents a generator bid and the, the lines, the generators are differentiated by color um, based on the type of energy resource. And you've got um, the uh, kind of legend of uh, colors for the different energy resources, as well as what some of the key assumptions are like fuel price. All right, so all the generators bid in and based on where demand falls for the time period, and in this instance, total demand is 60 gigawatts, uh, the marginal generator sets the market clearing price for, for the whole market. Um, and all the other generators that, uh, that bid in, they receive that market clearing price. In this case, the market clearing price is $41 a megawatt hour. So you can see that wind and solar, they bid in at $0 a megawatt hour because their marginal cost, their fuel cost is zero. But what they get paid is this market clearing price. Occasionally, we see market clearing prices go negative in these markets, and there are really two reasons for this. Um, first, it could be that renewable energy generators are bidding in uh, at a negative price. Um, and this might be because, this, this could be because wind energy generators um, and other renewable energy resources benefit from uh, a subsidy, um, the prime subsidy being a federal production tax credit of between $20 and $30 a megawatt hour. So wind energy generators can bid in at negative $20 to $30 a megawatt hour and still break even. Um, the other reason why prices might go negative in a market is because coal and nuclear generators that um, where it's costly for them to ramp up and down um, they would, in many instances, would rather pay the grid to be able to stay online uh, rather than uh, uh, absorb the cost of ramping. All right. So wholesale electricity prices, 
in these markets, they vary over time. Uh, you can see in this chart on the left uh, what wholesale energy prices were um, in ERCOT over the summer months of 2019. And you can see that there's a lot of variability from an average of $23 a megawatt hour to a high of $9,000 a megawatt hour. So there's the average and the highs that you can see here. So this volatility in price is increasing, particularly uh, with more renewable energy on the grid, as well as um, with more extreme weather events. Prices also vary based on location. Um, so there's a locational value to electricity, depending on where supply and demand is located on the grid and how much transmission capacity there is to transmit uh, supply to demand centers. This heat map on the left shows uh, electricity prices in ERCOT on a summer day in 2019. And you can see that prices are low in West Texas, uh, but uh, where there's a lot of wind energy capacity, but not a lot of demand. Um, and prices are high at the demand centers in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and along the Gulf Coast. Um, so this, is, this exists because there's insufficient transmission capacity to transmit the excess of wind energy in West Texas to these demand areas. And so that's why you've got negative electricity prices out here and really high electricity prices at the demand centers. Okay, so we talked about wholesale energy markets. Let's talk about long-term energy markets. And I wanna call out um, integrated resource plans or IRPs, which are long-term roadmaps that utilities use to plan out generation, transmission and distribution over multiple years. Um, utilities will submit their IRPs to their public utilities commissions for approval. And based on these plans, they might you know, retire a power plant or build a new one or build new transmission capacity or go contract for a power plant um, from an independent power producer. And you can see some of these plans from Pacificor uh, and uh, the public service company of Oklahoma um, where you know, IRPs that, that are kind of reflective of IRPs over the past decade or so that have by and large announced retirements of uh, older or uneconomic coal-fired power plants um, and, and nuclear power plants and, and, and then announced large procurements for wind, solar, energy efficiency and energy storage, which is pretty exciting. All right, so uh, one of the ways that long-term power prices are, are, are set are through what's called power purchase agreements, which are uh, or PPAs, which are long-term fixed price uh, agreements between a generator and a customer or an off-taker. Uh, the customer could be a utility that's entering into a long-term PPA with an independent power producer, or it could be you know, a large end user like Stanford procuring from, uh, uh, you know, entering into a PPA for a uh, sun power owned utility scale solar project in Southern California. You've also got what's called long-term capacity markets. And the point of capacity markets is to ensure that the grid always has a buffer between forecast demand and available resources in order to ensure that the lights stay on even during uh, extreme events. Um, for example, if a large generator trips offline or demand spikes unexpectedly. So that's why, you know, in this KISO supply curve um, here of, of available resources, you've got a big gap between the forecast demand and the available resources. Um, but California doesn't have capacity markets per se. They have what's called a resource adequacy uh, program, where it requires a 15% buffer above forecast demand. And capacity markets, they compensate generators not for electricity generated, not based on megawatt hours, but based on just being available during those periods of peak demand. So, you know, in a capacity contract, a utility might uh, agree to pay a generator a set price just for the generator being available during 15 days out of the year. Um, those days of very high peak demand. Um, but the generator is going to get paid regardless of whether or not the utility calls on that generator to power up during those 15 days out of the year. All right. And finally, we have the ancillary services markets. Uh, that, as I mentioned, pay a premium for assets depending on how quickly they can ramp up and down um, in response to short-term variability in supply and, and demand um, on the order of subseconds to minutes. Again, they're really designed to ensure reliability on the grid in the short term. Taking a step back, uh, I want to call out the fact that there's no real standardized design, market design for these different markets amongst ISOs and RTOs across the U.S. So the structure of these reliability markets is a continuing regulatory discussion 
in, um, at the state, regional, and federal level, even within FERC, uh, given the evolving electricity uh, grid dynamics that we talked about at the beginning of this lecture. All right, so grid operators, they have a variety of tools available to them for managing grid reliability and responding to changing demand and changing weather dynamics and increasing levels of renewable energy on the grid. Grid balancing tools include, you know, developing robust capacity and ancillary services markets like we talked about, uh, changing the load curve with demand response, you know, asking uh, large industrial and commercial customers to reduce their demand uh, during peak periods of the day, or, you know, uh, directly managing EV charging and shifting it to those off-peak periods redesigning retail electricity rates to incentivize when customers are using electricity, something that uh, Zach Ming is going to talk more about, um, building out tr the transmission system, expanding um, regional, regional grids um, to get more diverse supply and more diverse demand, um, installing smart grid technologies uh, like synchrophasers, um, and also increasing other flexible resources that are available on the grid, whether you're talking about energy storage, or even natural gas peaker plants. So because grid operators have these you know, many tools to integrate renewable energy onto the grid, we're seeing higher and higher levels of renewable energy penetration. Uh, this map here, it shows annual renewable energy penetration by state in 2020, uh, but even instantaneous renewable energy penetration is much higher than this in several states. Uh, like KAISO, renewable energy penetration has gotten above 98% on, on certain days. So, uh, grid operators, they have, you know, uh, a lot of tools available to them, to, them to, uh, to, to increase renewable energy penetration on the grid. All right. Thanks all.